So thanks so much for having me. It's really amazing to see a packed house here. So thanks so much for showing up. And wow, it looks like we've been going strong for a long time. And I really appreciate the opportunity. And I'm entirely humbled to get to lead something called the Risk Five Foundation because I know that it's not about me. It's about this community that is growing, that is fostering success, that is going to work on hard topics every day and doing it collaboratively. So it's really an honor and thanks for having me. Uh, if you are not already active in the dialogue with Risk Five on the social media side, please feel free to engage us there. We obviously also have public uh, community forums as well as member areas where we can dive deep into specific topics. So I trust that many of you are already on the BAT channel. Uh, if you're not, please uh, feel free to join that conversation. Let's see how the, if this clicker is the one. There's a lot, lot going on over here. There we go. Got it in three places. So uh, this is a little bit of a retrospective on why our time is now. Why is this the inflection point? Why are we looking at a revolution in how we compose, construct, create new levels of processing. And part of this goes back into the 80s. Uh, you looked at the processor wars at that time. A lot of different processors were kind of looking for opportunity in the server space and the desktop space. Remember those desktops with a handle on the top? That's what we were looking at. We had processors from Atari and many others, right? Uh, and, and that kind of came out, uh, you know, at the end of that, with Intel taking a leadership position with a very proprietary approach. If you think back uh, many years, open source was really quite new. It, it was, it's kind of had some roots in software, but it hadn't really caught on yet in hardware. Uh, fast forward into cell phones, and that's where we saw ARM start to really gain traction uh, with their licensing model, with their model of collaboration. So we started to get the wheels going on collaboration a bit. One of the screens is like rainbow land, and the other one looks good. Um, but you can still see good ones here. Uh, we are now ushering in the next generation or the next inflection point in that level of innovation. And that's all driven by the workloads, all driven by the demands that we're seeing. We're not going back to try and recreate a lot of what happened in the server, desktop, and mobile space. We're looking forward. We're looking at artificial intelligence, AR, VR, uh, IoT, uh, embedded, automotive, all kinds of other uh, industrial applications and things where those workloads are demanding something fundamentally different at the processor level. And this is familiar to all of you. Those differences may be in memory, may be in processing, may be in uh, the level of power consumption that those uh, drive. And that is what is ushering in this next wave of innovation and why taking an open source approach allows you to compose more specifically what is going to serve your workload. This, I'll talk a little bit about some of those opportunities. 5G is the latest one upon us. You know, we're no longer just asking our phones to keep us connected to email and make phone calls. We're now running and managing all kinds of different uh, infrastructures using our phones, attaching to corporate systems, social systems, uh, consumer and business needs. All of this is being driven through some of those devices. And we're continuing to see those advances come into other forums as well, other endpoints, other compute needs. I mentioned that there are advances and that the workloads are really driving the processor need. So part of that is around cloud, right? Cloud still has a data center that's still crunching that information and storing that data, but it is relying on uh, an increasing level of endpoints feeding information and where at all possible to reduce the level of data coming back to that data center to uh, make decisions and uh, process information at the endpoint. We're also seeing advances in automotive. I bought a new car about a week before I took off for Europe on our uh, six city road, road show. It felt like a road trip, but it was a road show. And, uh, you know, I think I drove it for like three days before I took off. The level of technology advances that have happened in the last five years is astounding. I am now being guided back into my lane. I'm being you know, stopped before I get too close to the next car. These types of things are especially important as we get into 
autonomous vehicles and other autonomous ways of transporting information and goods and people. Uh, on top of that, we're seeing more advances in industrial IoT. What can we automate? What can we do to automate the production and uh, other capabilities that we can free ourselves up and our, our talent up to do other things? We're also seeing this continue in mobile. We're seeing this continue across uh, a wide variety of both consumer and business devices. So this is a snapshot of some of those. Each of us is making processor decisions based not just on technology alone. If you look at these particular areas, we're making those decisions based on our strategy, based on our organization's sweet spot, right? And when you make a decision, you have to look at many factors. You look at who are your partners? How does your supply chain uh, uh, kind of treat that processor or that architecture choice? You look at it from a technical feasibility risk, uh, you know, in terms of like alleviating risk in your decision making and long-term strategic durability. You want to make sure that you're making decisions that will last not only for this year, but for the next 20 years. So risk five, as you're all familiar with, I, I actually kind of feel like most of you could probably give this pitch a little bit better than me because of your depth and history with risk five, which is phenomenal to be a part of. So thank you for your, uh, your thoughts here, and I will take helpful tips later. Uh, when you think about risk five and why that's a great decision, first of all, it's an architecture that is uh, much newer and built differently, built differently in terms of accomplishing uh, the processing needs across a huge diversity of workloads. So that comes in a modular approach. It's simple, it's small, and you grow that capability through extensions. So you can choose just what is important to your implementation and not what is more general purpose. It's also free and open. We've uh, made this available, I guess, under the CERN language, under a P license. It's a permissive license, right? And it's free and open for commercialization. And we, uh, you know, if you want to use the trademark and other marks associated, we do need you to become a member of the foundation, but otherwise you're free to use it. And we don't have uh, any reciprocity of uh, contributions required. So that kind of opens up the realm of possibility. You can experiment with it, you can commercialize it, you can build uh, additional extensions for it and make those open or proprietary, depending on your model. When it comes down to open source, and I've been around open source in the hardware side of the business for about 10 years. Uh, if you want to you know, look me up on LinkedIn, I spent about 12 and a half years at IBM and helped to cultivate strategies in the hardware side of the business around open source. And the thing about open source that we can all appreciate is that it's not a charity. You want a charity, you can go do a fun run or a bake sale or something else to feel good about yourself. Open source is about leveling the playing field so that we can progress as an industry, not only in our capabilities, but in becoming meaningful uh, kind of participants in a larger ecosystem, in a larger community. And that's where it becomes very important that we allow for not only freely sharing and collaborating, but also the opportunity to go build your business on top of and around the technology. So welcome to the revolution. <laughs> Perhaps you're welcoming me. I, I did join in, in March, so I, uh, you know, I've gotten my, my wheels going here, and I think that uh, it's been a tremendous uh, you know, kind of eye-opening experience for me to see the momentum of this community. Uh, it's been an honor to meet the community, to engage with you. Uh, and we are making a lot of progress. So why is the foundation important? If we, we can all just uh, post things and, and work together online, but what is the purpose of the foundation? And we'll get into that a little bit. At the very core of it, I believe that the foundation can provide more to this community than, and, and that is necessary for the success of this architecture than any one company could provide by themselves. Right? So we have lots of big logos. They have deeper pockets than many, many of the other members. They could easily go and uh, subsidize programs of these all by themselves. But nobody wants to go solo anymore, right? That's kind of a proprietary uh, you know, flash from the past. 
We want to do things collaboratively together that help everyone in the community succeed. Because even if you're a large company making a strategic architecture decision, you need to know who your partners are, who your supply chain is, who else in your community can you collaborate with to reach new spaces, new geographies, and new implementations. So that's what we're doing together, and we're making a lot of progress. Here's a snapshot of some of the things that have hit the news over the last six months or so. Uh, and we're making you know, a huge splash in this space. We're getting a lot of attention. Uh, again, if you're active on social media, you'll certainly see a lot of that. But from very small, de you know, uh, lightweight designs to very meaningful uh, HPC inroads, we are absolutely seeing the progress. And that's a lot of your progress. We're seeing a tremendous growth in the foundation. This is a chart that's pretty much always out of date because we're signing on new members constantly. Many of them are individuals, individual developers and engineers who are engaging with, with their talent and resource and advocacy for the foundation. Here's what that picture looks like today. So you've all been part of this, many of you, from the very beginning, and we're very grateful for that. But as you can see, we're continuing to grow. We have about 100 uh, members who are companies of less than 500 people. This is a huge sweet spot for entrepreneurs, for folks to kind of take a dive in to start their own thing, to build a business on Risk Five. And I've been an entrepreneur before. I started four different companies. I know the blood, sweat, and tears that go into that. Along the way, we also have universities and individuals, large corporations at many different parts of that community. I think of this community as having many neighborhoods, and I'm so glad to meet the technical, the business, the strategy, and then all the different companies, the geographies that we're bringing on. It's astounding. So what do we get by doing this together in a foundation more than any of us could do best on our own? These are the six programs that we're bringing out. And I've introduced these in Zurich, so for some of you it may be uh, somewhat familiar. But first, technical deliverables. We are collaborating on technical deliverables across a wide number of uh, work groups and, and uh, committees to make technical progress so that we can help fill in the blanks and help you have a collection of composable parts to best realize your design. And that's important. Without a large, broad collection of pieces and parts, many of us will just go invent our own. That defeats the purpose of having this community. So we're working on technical progress. We're working on compliance, things, tools and resources to help you ensure and, and to assure your supply chain and partners and customers that your design will fit and interoperate with all the other parts of the ecosystem. We're working on visibility. Some people call it marketing. I think it's visibility. It's amplifying the great progress that's going on across the community as well as by the foundation, but primarily looking to amplify that this is mainstream, that this is here and now. Also, we have learning and talent. Learning and talent comes in two flavors. One, it's professional training and development uh, courses, community, uh, starter packs, in, intro to risk five, opportunities to learn and come up to speed quickly, and it's also engaging universities, ensuring that we have and can connect uh, universities to curriculum on risk five. The next area is around advocacy. In my experience, engineers and, and developers like talking to other engineers and developers. They're facing a challenge. They want to know where the community is. They want to have good code patterns and other mechanisms to get up to speed quickly on the new areas that they're facing in their design. This is also something that's important in creating local centers of gravity. So we have local meetups that are, are helping with that. And then finally, marketplace. As our members come out with products and capabilities and tools and resources and other offerings, we want to make them very easy to find. So we're putting ourselves in the mix by saying, hey, we're just going to route that traffic to you. And by the way, this is not where the royalty model comes in. This is simply a piece of us connecting and playing matchmaker between our members and our community at large. So we're making some progress on compliance and technical deliverables. These are the 20 different work groups and, and committees that we have. Uh, many of you are involved in several of these, so thank you. 
on meetups. We now have 2,000 plus and growing members that are attending our meetups that are happening around the world on learning and development. We are uh, focused on creating a set of curriculum that may be shared as well as other tools and resources for, for learning. And then finally, I just want to got two different slides now. <laughs> uh, you know, so those six programs are things that we are, are leveraging to bring to the community. That's where those membership dollars are coming into. And I'll say, uh, you know, just a couple more things. Uh, we made some announcements in Zurich on transitioning to some new membership structure so that we have, number one, first and foremost, better governance. We are going to have better representation at all levels of our membership within our board of directors and within our technical leadership. We are moving to a model uh, that will have a non-confidential uh, task group, work group uh, provision so that all companies, all members may feel welcome to participate. Now that also is a big hint. Please don't bring your company's secret sauce into the meeting. I mean, you shouldn't be doing that anyway if your intention is to open source it. But the goal here is to make things open and transparent. It's, it's more open source that way, and that's more consistent with open source models. And then finally, we are, uh, through our membership structure, we are uh, having three different levels, a free community level that will be uh, primarily focused on universities and individuals, a basic membership level called strategic that will have tiered pricing based on how uh, big or small the company is, and then a top level that is really for those who are all in, it would be willing to help us underwrite the programming for everyone. Those are some things coming out, and you'll see this in the, in the next couple of months. In stride with this, we are actually moving the foundation uh, incorporation to Switzerland. This is something that's been talked about and announced in various pieces and parts for about the last six to nine months. I think some announcements were happening on this uh, prior to my arrival. The reason we're doing this is that there's a lot of geopolitical tension, and while open source is uh, an exception within the U.S. export control, it has been causing, you know, the geopolitical tensions have been causing a great deal of angst and uh, hesitation on investment, and we see this as opening up greater opportunity for everyone to participate. So that's kind of the end of my talk. Again, heavy plug to join the conversation. These are ways that we're doing that uh, through some of our social media. And I'm not a lawyer, so please don't send me all of those CERN questions that you had. I will be around, too, if you want to have some uh, questions that way. And Zvonimir here is on our board, too, so he, he's also open. Okay, so I have a question. Uh, are, are you seeing Risk v uh, moving primarily into the uh, AI and, and server spaces? Uh, is, that, is that what you're targeting right now? So... You know, there are, are more than just risk five open ISAs to pick and choose from. And it would be wrong of me to say that it's only in one part of the industry because that would diminish the incredible efforts that folks are, are making and impact they're having in other parts, right? So, you know, we have companies who have announced uh, risk five in storage controllers, for example, Svonimir. And we have other companies who have announced great progress going on in AI, both in the data center and as well as in IoT. What I'm seeing, but not quarantining us to, I'm seeing a lot of interest in Risk v for those new workloads where there isn't already investment in another architecture. That's sort of the, you know, the common sense approach that many are taking as they approach Risk v Calista, thank you very much for the talk, uh, that I'm part of the Risk Five revolution. Um, I'd like to take you a bit wider and um, um, go back to something that came out right at the AGM, which I know you weren't there, of, which is about you are a woman 
who is at the top of the electronics industry and indeed at the top of the open source industry. And that latter is probably even scarcer. I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't look up or down to see where I was in the stack, yeah. but, I'm just, but part, I'm just part of the crew. Yeah, so there are very few women in this room, and I wonder if you have thoughts on how open source and risk five can help get the other half of the population engaged in technology and hardware design and silicon chip design. We almost thought we had our first risk five high school join, and I was super excited until I realized that it was in German, and Hochschule really actually just means university. So, um, you know, my German's a little rusty, but we do hope to, you know, attract everyone to open source. I think open source, it, you know, it's kind of gender gender neutral, right? I mean. I haven't thought of myself first as being a woman in technology for a long time. I realize it is a little odd, but you know the bathroom lines are short, so that's good for me. Um, I, I am always happy to work with and talk to groups who are um, trying to kind of bring more underrepresented folks into technology, into open source, into hardware in particular. Trust me, hardware. Uh, is a tough field relative to services and software. You know, I, I saw, I've seen this for, for many, many years. Um, but if there are opportunities for me to help uh, kind of encourage that excitement, I'm always happy to participate. But please, if you are approaching one of those underrepresented groups, whether it's whatever, 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 um, see them first for their talents and their contributions to this space. And then maybe later, like way later, see them for what it is that qualifies them as underrepresented. Uh, there can still be more questions. Thank you very much.